Um, what I was asked to do today was just give a little bit of background on transportation and parking in downtowns and why it's different than a lot of other places and why that really matters. Um, you guys have a beautiful downtown. I mean, uh, it was serendipitous that this picture was taken back, I think, uh, around in January um, uh, at dusk, just a, a quick capture. Um, we, we've been getting a lot of mileage out of this one, but you, you guys have a, uh, have a really great, uh, great Main Street character. So I want to go into a little bit of history of kind of what has happened over the years and how we've gotten away from good, sound downtown planning, uh, transportation planning practices. Um, you know, there's great downtowns all over the country, and you know, they all had one thing in common, they all had really great street network, uh, street environments uh, in their downtown, um, but something happened. We kind of got lost a little bit um, about, uh, in, in about the 1950s, uh, after World War II, when you had, had the mass exodus of people leaving for the suburbs, um, and a lot of what happened there was, we started looking at almost, uh, and, and as an engineer I can say this, a lot of it was our fault. We started looking at a one-size-fits-all approach to transportation planning and engineering in the country. So you know, we were actually starting to do things that really focused on moving cars as quickly as possible as if nothing else mattered. Uh, how many of you have heard this term, uh, level of service? Okay, um, I hate it. As a traffic engineer, as a traffic engineer training, I hate it because uh, what I find in downtowns is that if uh, if most if a lot of downtown streets were to bring a letter grade home to them in a healthy downtown, uh, they would end up grounded by their parents uh, because this this fallacy of this letter grade uh, level of service. Uh, what's happening is it really just focuses on car movement and doesn't focus on anything else. And anything else that you would see happening in a downtown, uh, people walking, people, people biking, uh, people using transit. Um, most really healthy downtown streets are actually at a letter grade level of service D or worse, as measured by our very uh, conventional guidelines. So for a long time, this was really all we kind of had to measure um, in, uh, in downtowns. And really our overarching, uh, our overarching mission was this, minimize vehicular delay. Let's pump as much traffic through here as quickly as possible. Uh, again, as if nothing else mattered. This is what we ended up with. We ended up with things that, so you were putting people uh, in positions in areas where they wanted to walk, but they literally couldn't. They didn't have any place uh, to do that. Um, you see this guy right here. Um, people want to get, want to be able to get to the other side of the street, and they may not necessarily want to uh, do that. Uh, may not necessarily be able to, to do that without being surrounded by two tons of steel. Um, Walkability is important. It, it, you know, we, we find that it's very, very important, especially in downtowns. I always say that downtowns are places that people want to go to not simply drive through. So you, you want to come to downtown. You want to come down, you want to park somewhere, and you, or, or you even want to ride your bike uh, if you're close enough uh, to be able to get downtown. And then once you get there, you want to be able to experience lots of different things. Um, so what has happened over the years is uh, we've, we've grown to a point, uh, we, we've been developing our transportation systems where it really makes it almost impossible to walk and therefore uh, is causing other uh, ancillary problems such as uh, health and uh, you know our, uh, our obesity trends across the country. Uh, I'm used to working in this part of the country, so we're you know we're we're, we're a little uh, less active um, in some degrees. Uh, but you know when we're dealing with real real issues here, and it's costing real dollars. Not to mention the health. I mean the health aspects for our kids. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I can remember walking or riding my bike to school. Nobody does that anymore. Um, so, and a lot of it's a product of how we've developed and how our land uses are developing. But there's real dollars attached to this with uh, long-term care uh, of uh, individuals um, as we do that. But we're starting to see a paradigm shift where even the health agencies are starting to recognize this and starting to get into community planning. Uh, and really looking at how community design ties into transportation. 
And one of the best places that is already set up for this is downtown. We have a, a fine grained network of streets, traffic is distributed. We've typically walked, we have a mix of uses. It's the kinds of things that uh, developers are trying to create in places, but we already have a lot of those ingredients here. <coughs> and so what that means from a transportation standpoint is we have other considerations. Um, in a lot of, and what we're really starting to see is the tie between land use and transportation and a recognition that it's not all about the all-encompassing vehicular level of service. Uh, we need to be concerned about overall livability and balance. We need to respect context, not only the natural context, but the built context. And to be able to develop systems that are in place, uh, allow service to the types of environments that are there, as well as the types of environments and the visions we want to be able to create. Um, and you know, this last one, uh, no longer are we as engineers design, going back to our cubicle and designing things and coming back to a public, uh, public hearing and saying, th this is the project. A lot of neighborhood and downtown planning is occurring in forums very much like this, where it's a true community collaboration, multidisciplinary team, everybody's in partnership, and you as the community articulate your vision uh, for what that's going to look like. Um, one of the big things with are this emerging transportation uh, philosophy, we're not no longer concerned with simply what happens curb face to curb face. Not just the car realm, we're looking at all of the realms. Uh, what's going on behind the curbs, what kind of facilities are we uh, trying to create? <clears throat> and again, we know that what that street looks and feels like really affects uh, the quality of that environment. By the way, this is Park Avenue and Winter Park. Anyone want to take a guess as to what the vehicular level of service of this street is? Letter grade? A through, a through F? What do you think? Sorry? Uh, peak hour, it's an F. Peak hour, it's an F. Most of the day it's operating as a D, yes. But um, I don't think anybody would say that Park Avenue is a failure. Uh, some of the highest rents in uh, Central Florida are bustling, uh, bustling uh, commercial Main Street district. We know that adding walkability or, or walkable places are more valuable uh, and they create more revenue generation uh, and, and more economic vitality uh, as well. And downtowns really are the type of product that our next generation is looking for. So, you know, what we're finding is that this next generation, generation of millennials, uh, they're not that interested in driving. Um, how many of you have a 16 year old at home? Do they have a driver's license yet? They do, okay. Um, and, and I find that in, in, uh, in Midwest and the Southeast that uh, it's, it's typical that we do, but you know, over the course of the country, 41% of 16 year olds don't have a driver's license. Uh, and you basically have to browbeat your kid to go get one. Um, I have a colleague that says, yeah, of course kids aren't interested in driving, it interferes with their texting. Um, but they're looking for, you know, this, this, this new customer base is looking for places that they're not saddled with car ownership and that they have things within walking distance um, and have availability. And other things that are happening with things like ride share, I mean, I, I got an Uber from the airport last night and came right downtown. Uh, no longer do you have to, you have to really uh, look at that. So what this is really pushing toward and, and dovetailing to is downtowns are great places for this, for this, uh, this next generation because a car in, in, quite frankly, a car in downtown can be a burden um, to be able to have to find a place to park it and uh, pay for that as well. Um, and quite honestly, the, some of these parking lots and, and what we're spending on parking and putting in parking, they're great opportunities uh, higher and better uses than, than what they are. Uh, so, it, you know, the opportunity to expand, generate revenue in your downtown uh, in, that, uh, in that real estate. And then again, this idea of a growth and diversity and transportation options in addition to what I mentioned with the ride share, you're seeing things now like uh, micro mobility. So scooters, electric bikes, uh, different ways to, for people to get around uh, as well. Again, uh, you know, this is what this, uh, this demographic uh, is actually looking for. Um, 
Another way that downtowns are different. So what I have here is I have an example of, and these, these blocks represent different types of land use. And this is, uh, you know, what you may see on one of your arterials, uh, like out, what is it, Mary University? University or Viking or... Yeah, so, so you see things like your, uh, your, your Walmart or your Target Supercenter uh, out there, but everything's segregated. So you may have a school pod, you may have a park pod, an office pod, a retail pod, and then surrounded uh, by a residential. Uh, whereas in downtown, you kind of have all of those things, smaller individual footprints, but agglomerated, pretty much the same, uh, you know, similar amount of space. This dotted circle is kind of key because what that represents is a five minute walk radius. And you can see in, uh, in this conventional suburban development, you don't get really far, and quite frankly, you're having to cross a, uh, a big road in a lot of locations. But in a downtown, you can cover much more within that five minutes. Exact same walk radius, but there's a lot more stuff within that uh, radius. What does that mean from a traffic standpoint? Uh, and again, also supported by a grid rather than just one street point loaded uh, with development. What does that mean from a traffic standpoint? Well, in this conventional uh, scenario, Pretty much any trip that you want to make among these different things, you have to get out on this road. So if you want to go retail to retail, uh, apartment to apartment or apartment to retail, uh, you have to get out on this road. So what's happening is every single trip ends up right here and you end up with a lot of traffic congestion on those roads. Whereas in a traditional uh, kind of development or a downtown type development, you're supported by this grid, therefore there's multiple ways to get around. And this focuses on vehicle trips. Um, what we find in downtowns is that a lot, some of these trips actually can get made uh, by uh, modes other than just vehicles. So our strategy that we would be looking at is this more holistic strategy in a downtown of uh, really looking at allowing that mobility system, providing those options to uh, support that land use vision, give a full range of opportunities. Sometimes we get accused of, you want to get everybody out of their car. No, I don't want to get everybody out of their car. I want to make sure that people have choices for their trips other than just their car. So we want to make sure that we have things in place that, that make it safe for people to walk or ride a bike or be able to take their car as well. Uh, you know, part of what we'd be doing is actually trying to set the direction for street design and really looking at this idea of uh, complete streets. Um, and what I mean by complete streets are streets that support all modes of transportation. Look at things like uh, availability, being able to park on the streets as well. And again, our goal in areas such as this is that we really want to be able to move people. And how are we moving people about our downtown? We're still moving cars, but we're focusing on how we move, uh, how we move the people. What we find is that the penalty for instilling walkability is often very, very small. <coughs> What we usually see is that by sacrificing maybe a few seconds of vehicular service, we can get these very large gains in overall livability of the transportation network and the transportation system. Um, what we also find is that you've got a finite space between buildings in downtown. And so how do you maximize that? If you really think of a street network and street right-of-ways as being an asset, being a community asset. Street right-of-ways are one of the greatest assets that a, a city or a town uh, could have. And so, much like any asset, if that asset's not performing the way that you want to, you reallocate it. And so we see a lot of uh, street space getting reallocated to better serve uh, a downtown. And when I say reallocated, looking at things like if it's kind of the space in between the buildings, if it's not performing the way that you want it to, uh, say that you have, uh, this is an example from Charlotte, this was a four lane street, but it didn't need all four lanes to carry traffic. So some of that space got repurposed for wider sidewalks, for streetscape, uh, for bike lanes, um, and still maintaining the traffic movement, but rebalancing that area between, uh, uh, between the building faces and seeing uh, new development that could happen there. <clears throat> so what it really is about is creating place within the streets and outside of the streets as well. 
And uh, what it's about is really trying to set the table for walkability. So really focusing on what happens uh, you know, outside of the vehicle realm, uh, being able to really create this, uh, this space and this space for people that moves people, provides them place, uh, and is holistically tied to the vision and enables that, uh, that vision to take place. The way we do that is through uh, complete streets. They're all about balance. They're all about really closing the gaps both between and among the different modes. Uh, and then really looking at being sensitive to the built environment as well as the natural environment. So really understanding the context, putting a street in place uh, that fits the context and enables that land use vision uh, to come to fruition. If we do that, we're increasing overall health. Remember the, the thing about the uh, obesity? People will walk more, improve their personal health. Uh, economic health, walkable places create, are, are definitely more valuable. And then you can also take, uh, you can also increase the ecological health of the community. Uh, this is an example of a rain garden. So it was, it's a piece of a street that uh, aesthetically pleasing, but it also serves a drainage purpose, uh, a stormwater purpose as well. So, uh, and then cleansing that. So a lot of the measures that we would use and some of the things we'd be looking at this week or, you know, are there ways to provide on-street parking, bike facilities, streetscape, um, gateways, medians, green infrastructure, and all of that really coming into placemaking. Because, uh, I mean, honestly, what would you rather have? Something that looks like this? Which one's a better place uh, to be in a better place to, to actually be. <coughs> Some of the things that we would want to look at is this idea of uh, medians, what can you do? Uh, you know, you, you guys, one of the things being, and I've, I've only been, been here, I think, <coughs> less than uh, 24 hours, but um, much like my hometown in eastern Arkansas, you guys are blessed with very wide streets. Um, and so, you know, are there ways that you can, where we can start looking at some things uh, to make it seem a little less wide and maybe reallocate that space uh, for, for other things. Medians would be a way to do that. Bring in some green on the streets, um, provide some refuge uh, opportunity. And even in places, streets that you have these center turn lanes, uh, can you start to insert some green areas within that? Space is already there, can, can you do some things uh, with that as well? Uh, you know, looking at things like green streets, again, from a stormwater management perspective, we did talk a little bit about some bioretention this morning with uh, public works and utilities. Um, but looking at, you know, are there opportunities to do those kinds of things as well? Uh, and then really understanding the, uh, the, the bicycling, cult, the cycling culture here. Uh, you know, here, uh, I guess, have over 100 miles of trails and greenways. Um, and really being able to look at expanding that uh, into the street network. One of the things that we find, and uh, you know, these guys are going to bike wherever, whenever, uh, and this guy is never going to ride a bike. I love that photo with the walking the dog outside of the car. Uh, but you got this whole uh, percentage, this whole big uh, 69, almost 70 percent that if better facilities are there, they're gonna be more inclined to ride a bike. So are there opportunities for us to do things like that as well? And we're beyond just the bike lanes uh, and the shared lanes. Uh, you know, well, some of the things that we're looking at um, and, and that we're seeing implemented around the country are this idea of basically separating bike facilities <coughs> in the street. Um, you know, studies have found that People are much more comfortable when there is some sort of physical separation uh, between the bike lane uh, and the cars. So are there opportunities to do that? Some of the things that, that we'll be looking at. Um, one important thing to note, we, we find that cyclists do spend money. Um, so you know, people, if we can start to draw people in from the Greenway uh, into downtown, they will come and patronize uh, and spend money there. Um, I know you've already had some experience with what we call uh, road diets, so actually reallocating some of that street space. Um, I always found it very interesting that uh, traffic engineering, as technical and math-based as, uh, as the discipline is, it's one place where two plus two does not equal four. Um, so there's a real difference between traffic volume and traffic capacity. 
And what we find is that, um, and this is an example from one that we, we did in Memphis, but what we find is that from a lane capacity standpoint, uh, each lane is not created equal. As you add lanes, those additional lanes on multi-lane facilities don't carry as much as, uh, as a lane on a two-lane facility. So as you add lanes, you're not doubling the capacity of the road. You're getting, you know, and it's a law of diminishing returns as the road gets wider and wider. So network, a fine-grained network of two-lane roads is going to carry more traffic than uh, a multi-lane road in a more suburban context. <coughs> Again, one of the reasons that downtowns are different because you already have that fine grid. Uh, what we find on a lot of our road diets, especially going from a four-lane undivided to a three-lane, and I know that uh, might be some opportunities <coughs> to look at, uh, traffic doesn't just disappear, and in some cases it actually increases. We actually see increases. So um, we still carry the same amount of traffic. Uh, a lot of the things that are happening uh, also starts to slow the speeds, uh, makes it safer, and uh, the slower traffic allows people to really see what's beyond the curves as far as uh, opportunities to stop and shop. Um, this is uh, an example, a couple of examples, one from Orlando, one from Charlotte, where this was done <coughs> looking at the speed reduction in these, uh, uh, on these two uh, facilities. Uh, and then also just what your cone of reference being able to see at these different speeds. So, if you're driving at 40 miles an hour, you're really focused further down the road and you don't care what's going on. But at 20 miles an hour, you, you really have the opportunity to kind of take a broader view and, and see what's going on and say, hey, I want to I want to go shop there and maybe be able to pull in and uh, pull in and shop. Uh, again, the walkability being important, I think uh, those of you that were here on uh, Saturday's kickoff probably saw this, but uh, speed kills, literally. Uh, again, it's not a linear relationship. If you are hit by a car as a pedestrian, uh, a car doing about 20 miles an hour, there's a, uh, you have a 95% chance that you will survive that collision. However, if the speed on that car doubles to 40, your chance of survival drops to 15%. So 85% chance that you're going to die. So again, in a downtown, it's very critical that we make sure the speeds are slow. Remember, a place that we want people to go to, not just drive through. Um, there's our little friend who still hasn't made it across the street. Um, one of the things that we see on these four to three road diets is that right now, at, on a four lane undivided road, uh, what we find is that the absence of the center turn lane uh, actually has a lot of detrimental effects. Uh, most notably, it creates um, rear end and side swipe uh, accidents. Um, however, the, um, that cross section will carry a similar amount of traffic uh, uh, as one with the uh, one lane each direction and a turn lane. Uh, and you can see what's actually happening here is this is a four lane undivided. And I don't know if uh, any, I don't know if you've got a situation like this, but as you come up to where you would be making a left turn, everybody through here knows that if I get trapped behind the one guy making this left turn, I'm not going to be able to make my turn. So uh, you can see what's happening. Everybody's over in the right lane because they know that they're not going to get trapped behind the <coughs> turning vehicle there. <coughs> So looking at the, and, and going back to that, so the other thing that happens here is somebody is coming along through here, sees the car stop, decides to jump over uh, and may sideswipe a vehicle but they don't see in their blind spot or they're not paying attention and they slam into the back. So the rear end and the sideswipe accidents are alleviated by that. Uh, again, a couple of examples of where that has, uh, this is Edgewater Drive in Orlando. They saw a 34% reduction in rear end and side swipe crashes uh, on that. Um, you know, the other thing that happens is make it, if it makes the road easier to cross, can provide a refuge opportunity uh, for pedestrians in the middle, uh, and so it allows people to be able to cross shop on both sides of the street without getting back into their car uh, as well.
You don't have a lot of one-way streets. I think you only have one piece of Washington. But one of the other things that, that we see in a lot, of, a lot of downtowns do have a lot of one-way streets. Uh, and what we find is that um, they were previously two-way streets. They get converted to one-way uh, during the 1950s, the so pre-interstate era, to get people in and out of downtown as quickly as possible and get back out to their uh, three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath, uh, 1.2 kids in the suburbs uh, as quickly as they can. But what, what we're finding is a lot of cities really looking at these street networks in downtown and what we call restoring two-way travel to the streets. Uh, and it really doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a huge effect on traffic, again, because of the grid. Uh, what it does do is it eliminates a couple of things. And one of the most notable things is on a two lane, one direction street, much like what you have on Washington. What can happen is people cross the street is somebody coming in this outside lane sees the pedestrian, the pedestrian steps out. They stop allowing the pedestrian to start to cross the street. However, if this guy is a big SUV, this one doesn't see that, doesn't see him coming. Uh, we call it the dual threat pedestrian conflict. Um, so hopefully uh, by going to two-way you uh, eliminate that. The other thing that happens, in, uh, and this is more applicable for uh, one-way streets in downtown urban environments, is that um, you really look at this idea of what we call retail eclipsing. So if you're traveling one direction on the street, uh, you can see this frontage, but you never see the frontage here. And what we find on a lot of these streets is these Frontages, uh, so these businesses are marginalized. If you go to a city with uh, one-way streets that uh, doesn't, that what, what I will guarantee is the, the first vacant buildings that you will find, or first vacant businesses, will be in this eclipse area. So it's something that, um, that, that you start to alleviate by giving everyone an equal chance of being seen on both the inbound and outbound commute uh, as well. Uh, again, cities that are doing these uh, what we call two-way conversions uh, add, uh, need to add Lynchburg, Virginia to that list. We just, uh, just finished up working on their downtown plan uh, and they're doing some significant one-way restorations. <coughs> um, how to get it right. And we actually, uh, as engineers, we borrowed a code from our urban design friends and really starting to try to articulate things in pictures. Uh, I know it's a, a novel concept for uh, engineers, but really starting to look at how do we make sure these kinds of things happen. That's one of the things that we'll be, we'll be working through uh, this week and through the course of this project. Identifying what the streets should look like and then giving the proper guidance to be able to construct those with the dimensions and uh, with the facilities and the, the character, characteristics. Uh, that should happen. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that we would, uh, you know, just an example from a uh, street retrofit in a small downtown just outside of Memphis, uh, Germantown, Tennessee. Um, this is what the street looked like. Uh, we had the center turn lane, uh, one lane of on-street parking, and then travel lanes in each direction. Um, and through the course of a process like this, came up with a streetscape plan uh, or a street modification plan that ended up adding an additional lane of parking, removed the center turn lane because the uh, development pattern didn't necessarily uh, support that, was able to widen the sidewalks, and then uh, this is what the street looked like before. Uh, this was the concept that was developed uh, through a course of a process much like this, and this is what um, this is a before again and a picture of that. And that's what, it, that's what it actually looks like today. So again, the wider sidewalks, the refuges, the mid-block uh, pedestrian crossing. At this, at this time, they hadn't striped the pedestrian crossing, but uh, I promise you it is, it is there today. Um, you have to be able to design it. And so the guidance that I was showing with the street typologies uh, lays the basis so that when it gets translated into the construction documents, it can actually be built. 
and it doesn't always have to be, um, it always doesn't have to be really, really expensive. Um, we have this term called tactical urbanism, which is basically going out, you can go out and put paint on the street and envision the street however you want to. However, it can be done in, uh, in other ways as well that may not be as temporary as paint or as uh, aesthetically challenged as paint may be, but you're also maybe not getting into the, uh, the expense of moving these curbs. So this is an example in a, in a, uh, just outside of downtown Memphis a um, street that the character and use has changed um, and so a lot of excess capacity again thinking of repositioning that asset um, this street needed to be was, was being asked to do other things so move other things other than industrial traffic which uh, it used to and so at a lower cost than moving curves uh, the city was able to uh, create people's space, remember the idea of place making, uh, incorporate public art, and add in some of the missing modes as far as bicycles, and picked up on-street parking in uh, a lot of locations. So picking up additional parking spaces in their downtown. Interesting thing, notice this curb line, still the same. Uh, this is a, uh, what's called epoxy gravel, uh, that actually started to define the street space, uh, protecting it with planters, and the domes, uh, and then resurfacing and restriping the street to accommodate the missing roads. Another view, <coughs> as you see the bike lanes, the parking areas uh, along the street that were uh, incorporated uh, in there as well. Again, the planters, some cafe seating in the public park component, uh, and uh, these, these uh, gentlemen are enjoying a nice frosty beverage from the, uh, the new brewery that opened up across the street uh, right in some of the people's space. So you don't have to get into um, hard reconstruction uh, to be able to realize some of these um, some of these enhancements. What does it mean in terms of real numbers? Well, looking at one corridor in Memphis that um, uh, Mary and Jeff and their team did some uh, early work on and we're now seeing uh, through implementation uh, they've seen over $30 million of reinvestment in uh, uh, about a four block corridor. 30, uh, 30 new businesses, uh, and really uh, by right sizing and repositioning this street asset, uh, being able to realize those benefits, um, set the table uh, for that investment as well. Let's talk a little bit about parking. You guys don't have a parking problem, do you? I, I can tell you I've never worked in a downtown that did not have a parking problem. So you guys are in really good company. But uh, what I will tell you is that um, parking can be fun, believe it or not. Um, my favorite, one of my favorite garages. I will tell you that if you're expecting us to snap our fingers and magically solve all the parking issues, that's not going to happen. Um, it's an ongoing battle, but what, what we can do is give you some tools on how to manage uh, that parking and it's not one it's not one silver bullet and it doesn't all happen at once it's recognizing certain triggers uh, and being able to respond to those triggers when they happen so some of the things that, that we want to make sure of is that we have uh, we provide a variety of product types with parking so on street lots when the time may be right a ramp um, but some of the best things to do are looking at some of the management strategies like understanding the dynamics of shared parking and being able to utilize uh, some of the parking resources that you can't utilize today in terms of uh, private lots. Uh, because really, you want your downtown to be a place where we call a park once environment, where people come, they park their car, and then they do lots of different things. Um, it has to be attractive. I've seen a lot of really ugly, ramps, garages, service lots. Um, and so there's opportunities to make sure that it's attractive uh, and then really understanding what that supply is that you need at each of these different points uh, as you move through a, a, a growth and maturation of your downtown. Again, understand how to manage the problem uh, and not necessarily solve it. So the idea of shared parking, you know, if you look at parking needs of specific uses, 
if these were all in a vacuum uh, in a conventional uh, suburban context, each of these would probably need their own parking. But if you look at the profile of what parking is needed over the course of the day, there's some complementary uses in a mixed use area, uh, such as the downtown. So in exclusive parking, you know, you're having to provide parking uh, for each of these individual uses, but whatever, everything, and, and you end up with things like this. Uh, but if those are all located proximate to each other, you can start to take advantage of some of the uh, peaks and valleys and dovetailing that, uh, those different uses, and really understanding where uh, that peak really is from a shared parking standpoint. So, you know, it reduces asphalt. Um, again, another benefit of the downtown being a mixture of uses uh, in that you kind of have this built in. You have this dynamic already built in. I have a quick question about that. Yeah. Uh, going back one slide, are you seeing that where it has restaurant and office, uh, are you considering that the restaurant part is an addition or that some of the people who are in the offices are using the restaurants too? It depends. I mean, it depends. The, um, you know, you've got your office peak, you've got your restaurant peak. Lunchtime, definitely a lot of the people that are, especially in a, in a mixed use environment, a lot of the customer base for those restaurants are in offices uh, that, are, that are right in downtown. Um, again, this is not tailored to any specific community. So, uh, you know, we haven't done that evaluation. You guys just had a parking study done um, that has some, uh, some findings. Uh, that, that we're aware of uh, as well. So again, this is just showing the dynamic between uh, those joint, you know, what, what those joint uses could be. Um, this is not your community, but uh, some of your findings in your parking <coughs> study, this is a small community uh, that I live in, that is in North Carolina, uh, healthy downtown. <coughs> and what we found in Edison was that uh, high utilization uh, on weekday mornings, uh, and especially ramping up around lunchtime. Um, and then on Saturdays when the uh, farmer's market and a lot of retail is happening. But it's really happening within this quarter. You've got a couple of blocks off to that quarter, and uh, it, it didn't really have that. Um, once, so one of the things that we would want to, uh, that we would be looking at is looking at some of the Looking at it both from the supply side uh, as well as the uh, demand side, and really looking at uh, reanalyzing your data as you move forward, and really understanding the situation because your situation is going to be dynamic as you have different things come online um, and different kinds of uses, and as you, as you walk through um, walk through your vision. But there's some certain trigger points. One of the things you just want to make sure that you have a handle on what that utilization is. Um, I know from your study, some of your on-street utilization is in the 75-85% range, uh, which starts to tell us some things. Um, <clears throat> but looking at that, uh, you know, we this was prepared for the Lynchburg, Virginia downtown plan. Uh, really analyzing that, analyzing that on-street utilization by every three months as well as your off-street lots. Uh, and some of their, they, they actually did have uh, structured parking in their downtown. Uh, as well. And then doing things when we have certain triggers that are met. So your time limit threshold. Uh, Lynchburg had a, a two hour time limit and then looking at, okay, if you're surpassing that for six hour, for at least six hours a day, if you're surpassing 75%, start to look at, do we need to change that? If you're starting to surpass that for uh, 85% for six hours a day, do you need to start looking at uh, pricing structure for that as well? Um, same thing with the off-street laws, uh, and then you know some of the uh, off-street uh, ramps or garages, and so different product types for different types of needs. On-street parking, short-term, high turnover. Um, your off-street parking lots, your service lots, can be a hybrid, so long-term parking but uh, could be for some short-term use uh, if it's priced, uh, if, if it's competitive with the, uh, the on-street parking. And then when you get into things like uh, garages or ramps, um, more longer-term 
vehicle storage. Uh, so they may not typically have time time limit thresholds uh, unless they were replacing some of the uh, surface parking, where you may have some short term at a reduced or even no cost uh, for short term parking uh, as well. <coughs> A lot of benefits to uh, parking management and kind of the spectrum, you know, early on, you know, are you looking at things like uh, pricing uh, that parking, creating revenue to start to pay for things in the future, such as a parking <coughs> ramp or such as streetscape improvements, enhancements to be able to maybe add on street parking uh, or, or even the lots. Um, some shared arrangements, so to maybe taking advantage of some larger uh, private lots, maybe lease agreements or at least maintenance agreements with the owners there that uh, you can start to tap into some of the uh, parking that may not necessarily be available. Um, and then looking at you know, some more advanced things. Um, so, you know, this first tier of management starts to uh, support things like your street network uh, and your, your uh, improvements uh, to the street network. And then secondarily, to start to look at funding things like uh, some of the garages as well. Um, you know, what we find with a lot of these, uh, these larger employer lots is this is what it looks like uh, in the evening or on weekends. So where you're seeing a large peak, a uh, large spike in usage, um, you may have some built-in opportunities. Um, I can tell you some of the pushback that you may get from property owners is we don't want to have to clean up after people that park there at night. Um, a lot of times that can be, we, we had, uh, had that in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, in Columbus, they actually, uh, the restaurant owners on the main street got together and actually ended up providing a downtown valet service. And by doing that, they were able to assure property owners that, hey, we'd like to use your lot for the valet service, um, and therefore, nobody but our valets will be going in and out with the cars and won't be leaving trash and they'll make sure that it's cleaned up. So working with those property owners um, uh, in different ways to do that, one of the, one of the ancillary things, um, one of the ancillary pieces on the, uh, downtown ballet is that it started to alleviate business owners concerns about I don't want my employees having to walk back to their car after the bar closes at 2 a.m. The valet service as they actually stay on until closing time their last one of the night is they walk the employees back they escort the employees back to their back of their cars in the lots um, so ways to deal with that um, you know what what it would require is at least a central entity at the city to be able to uh, be able to form those shared parking agreements and maintain those. Uh, some of the things we'll be looking at uh, this week about how to be able to make that happen. <coughs> and, and it is, you know, I, I think a measure of success would be if you do get to a point where you are looking at downtown has become so wildly successful, we're running out of land, and we really need to be looking at Um I would caution you that when you do that, look for partnerships. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, this week about how to forge those and how to fund those uh, as well. But uh, yeah, this is an example in Charleston where the city uh, had a single-use parking garage that held 560 spaces uh, adjacent to the College of Charleston. Um, it needed to be replaced from a, a structural standpoint. So they partnered, it was a public, public, private, private partnership, or I guess public and private, so the college being a private school. Um, but it was a joint effort by the college, by the city, and by the private development community, private development community. Uh, what they created was they replaced the 560 space garage with a 620 space facility. It's actually wrapped on three sides. But what it does is it includes ground floor retail, CBS uh, on this floor. You see the portal to the garage. This is all student housing for the College of Charleston. Upper class with student housing. Students can live above, um, live above the facility. And then down in this other corner, 
uh, the college actually relocated their uh, main dining hall uh, into that corner of the facility. Mm -hmm. So a lot of partnerships that can happen. Um, some of the revenue we'll be talking this week, we'll be looking this week at some of the revenue streams mm -hmm. to hopefully be able to make some of that happen. Uh, but you want to be able to position yourself uh, for those kinds of things as well. You no longer have to have the lollipops. So you, you know, a, lot of, um, a lot of your own parking meters, when you look down the street, it looks like lollipops all the way down the street. It takes up valuable sidewalk space. Most communities are going to more of a kiosk-based system. I believe your parking study that you just had done actually introduced this concept and was looking at maybe this for some of the, the lots that you, the, the lots that are already uh, for pay. One of the really, uh, one of the really neat things about this system is because it's not mechanical, it can respond. So if you want to have free parking, people can put in their <coughs> license number and maybe they get two hours of, they get their first two hours free. Um, when you do pricing, the pricing can be flexible. It's not going out and changing uh, the, the parking uh, wheels on uh, those lollipops. The other thing that they do, a lot of these can be tied right to this thing that we're all probably carrying in our pocket, where you can actually pay for that online uh, with your phone uh, as well. So, you know, these are all things and, and they can be very dynamic and uh, change very easily as well. The other things that we're seeing, uh, some of the other trends that we're seeing in downtown is this idea of these mobility hubs. So where everything comes together, and you have car sharing, you have the transit service that's coming together, and you're having parking. Uh, and you're also having um, development that's happening. So the, you know, are there opportunities to look at uh, that kind of thing here? From a parking standpoint, uh, what I think we will be coming out of this week, and something similar to what we came out of in uh, Lynchburg, was some short term, like right now, zero to six months kinds of uh, strategies and actions, some midterm, uh, you know, one to three years, and then longer term beyond three years. And, but each one builds on another, each one's based on certain triggers that as you understand the data and where things are uh, and where you are in the process, uh, really being able to evaluate those different triggers uh, as, you, as you move forward. So um, just kind of one, of one place where it's all come together is in Chattanooga. Uh, and you see that on the riverfront there, but um, you know, actually looking at uh, a highway that's separated downtown from the river, um, looking at this idea of reallocating resources, um, you know, creating the river walk, uh, and then what that actually happened, uh, and this is what it looks like today. There's that same building, and you see a lot of redevelopment along the river, the river walk reconnected downtown to the city. Uh, and set the stage for a new development.